my name is Andrew Woods. I'm the manager of The Hive. So welcome to this new facility. Um, I know some of you have been here before, but those of you who haven't, it's a new facility designed to uh, encourage and enable and facilitate um, uh, research activities in fields relating to visualisation, virtualisation and simulation. And uh, obviously the, the main uh, uh, visible portion when you walk into this space is the four large scale display systems and uh, hopefully you'll have a chance to uh, come through this space at some stage and get a demonstration of all the capabilities of this, this various, the various displays. The purpose of uh, today's um, get together is uh, to um, um, a talk by Dr Philip Stothard who's with the WA School of Mines and uh, he'll be uh, talking about the use of virtual reality and simulation in, uh, in the mining industry. So, over to you, Philip. There you go. Okay, thanks, everyone, for coming to see what I've got to say. Um, the talk I'm going to give you today, I'm just going to give a short PowerPoint presentation that's just a summary of sort of a 10 to 14 year project. Uh, and it's, it's pretty well a, a summary of um, introducing a new technology, a sort of 21st century technology, into an old established industry where the, uh, and where there's quite a bit of resistance to change but as you uh, present new technologies in an incremental fashion you can build up momentum in the industry and they gradually take the, the technology on. So the project that I uh, worked on was actually developed at UNSW when I was at the School of Mining Engineering there and the visualization systems as we go through the uh, the presentation were developed at in the School of Mining, the first ones, just from hardware that we brought together, uh, VRS from uh, Queensland, and then iCinema at UNSW. Um, so there was a progression of technologies, but what I would like to talk about is not just the development of the technology, but also some of the background information and how difficult it is to get that to put in, integrate it into the virtual reality simulations. So just to set the scene and give you an idea of why we did this, um, the project aim is to provide a safe and give, forgiving environment to mine workers so that they can actually learn about mining operations because mining is a very uh, complex area um, and the issue with it is that most of the problems that people have got to contend with are actually buried underground and they're, they're, it's a 3D problem and it's very difficult to visualise that just by discussing it 2D drawings and text, etc. One of the key catalysts for this particular project was that since the 1970s and 80s, mining machinery processes and the way that uh, mine operations and people, the way that people work, had, had changed significantly. Um, and to sort of combat that and look at safety, many complex rules and schemes are introduced to improve safety and manage risk. But one of the bad things of that was that there are volumes and volumes of information and you can see on that chart there that's just a, um, a very brief snapshot of all the work procedures, legislation, rules and regulations that would apply to one specific task. So there were all these rules and regulations, there would become some controls over risk but the problem was that uh, accidents and injuries were still occurring and unfortunately fatalities as well. So what the, the industry were asking was, is there a simpler method for us to present that information and have it, rather than have loads of text and drawings, um, can we use a visual media to do that? So what um, we did, we developed a four stage project. It was, it was seen to be a long term project and the idea was that the first part would be a feasibility and scoping study to look at what technology was out there. Um, develop a prototype do some field testing in-house, and then the third part would be to develop an industry prototype to see whether the industry really liked this technology, how we, they would want us to enhance it, and eventually it moved into full industry scale projects and full commercialization. And that's the state that that, that project is actually at now where it's become a commercial e entity. To give you an idea of the project timeline, um, It's now 2014, but there was a, the project took pretty well 10 years. Um, from 1999, the, the concept was conceived. 
the scoping study and it went through all those various processes there and it went from uh, just a, a pilot project to an enhanced industry project and it also went from coal to hard rock uranium and then started to bring the, uh, the simulations into uh, MEA, Mining Education Australia's education program and then uh, again project commercialization. So with virtual reality, just to give you an idea of the concept, and this shows the, um, pretty well the, the date of when this was first brought together because it was talking about Sega games. I don't know if they're still around, but the idea was, uh, and some of these parts uh, of the simu VR simulations never really got to, to fly properly in there, and I was just talking to some people before about them. We should probably revisit those. But the idea was that ultimately, we want to build a knowledge management system where mine workers, uh, equipment producers, safety people, trainers, etc., they can actually build and maintain a, a knowledge management system. So we're looking for them to build best practice through collaboration. So the idea is if they've got a problem in one mine or one area, how have they solved that problem and they share that information. Um, we want them to develop, develop safety management plans with input from companies, conferences, and studies to, to bring this information together. Um, we're looking for people to provide information from relevant sources, so I, I, the idea is that we take the, the best practice and people try to keep raising that up and that, that makes sure the system is continually improved. An important part is that we want the, any simulator to actually be a game type simulator, so you, it encourages people to interact with it rather than passively sitting um, in lectures similar to this. And the idea is that we would train people, continually upskill them, and maintain their competency, but also their proficiency in the way that they operate equipment and work within the environment. Um, an issue that we were looking at as well was that we thought might be quite important is looking at risk-taking behaviour. Do people are people prone to risk-taking behaviour in the industry? And um, as you'll see with some of the. the VR simulations I'll show you before, there's a lot of machinery there and some of the, the rules and practices are very complex so people tend to shortcut them. So ultimately we're looking for competent workers, they're more risk aware before they ever go out on site. The system continually uh, feeds back on itself and we've got that process of continual improvement and gradually uh, build this best practice. Um, some of the key aspects that we're looking at is that the system must be interactive, it can't be passive, so to progress through any VR simulations people must interact, answer questions or solve problems. Um, we're looking for a simulator that's modular so that we've got components from one location can actually be bolted together with, it, with another one and everything uh, a bit like Lego where it's built in blocks. Uh, it, want, it needed ab, uh, web access, and at that time there was no real social media like Facebook, and I think that would be probably a, a good addition for getting people to discuss some of these issues. And we were looking at a New South Wales Australian capability in the first instance focusing on coal, because there was a defined problem there. Some of the criteria talking to people in the industry that we said, what would you want in this type of system? Um, The, um, it, one of the things is cost. It was an un, uh, unproven technology and it needed to be affordable relative to the, to the small size of the mining market. I know everybody thinks the mining's super rich, but it's, it's quite a small market and to get technology like this into there, it needs to be uh, quite cost effective and accessible to everybody. Um, they wanted that photorealistic s images not just cartoons or stick creatures within there. That was considered quite, quite important. The trainees must make decisions and also experience the consequences. And you'll see that in a, one of the demonstrations that I, I show you after. Um, a key area as well that was considered for uns, uh, uh, essential for ongoing success was that the system must be simple and quick to keep up to date. Now, um, again, I'll make a comment at the end about that. I think that we started to move away from that as the systems got more or more complex, uh, complex. and uh, that comment there also proved to be essential during the development process. So the way that we got the technology together was uh, I did a feasibility study 
in 2000. I went around various research organizations and companies, uh, looked at what was being developed at various, location, various locations within the industry. Uh, looked not just at VR, but also all types of media, uh, multimedia technology. Um, and the culmination of that was that we'd got a lot idea of what was out there. Things ranged from $3,000 PCs, base systems that AIMS and CSIR were producing up to the uh, multi-million dollar aircraft simulators used by people like Qantas and that, that. So essentially there were three options that we came up with that we presented to the client. The first one, and just bear in mind that at that in 2000, out on mine sites, the idea of networked PCs in training environments, they weren't right there. There's been quite a significant change over the past 10, 14 years. So that was not a novel approach then. But the key factors were that there, there was a central da database of information that was actually providing safe work procedures and safe operating plans and develop that forum for best practice. So that's where the idea was that anybody could log in and improve that or look at how people were doing things. It's ad administered by a, centrally by some sort of PC system and it's linked to a knowledge network or, uh, and safety management system via internet access. Uh, that, that was novel then, but there are all these uh, social media sites now that is actually th that link. Um, there's various trainee and PC views, and the trainees then interface with various controls in the VR environment, and the, the idea is that the VR environment behaves like it would do if they were in the real world. And I'll, that image that's on there, I'll show you afterwards the, uh, the sort of resolution you can get in the images. The second system was uh, a site-based simulator. The idea was that we had a purpose-built facility like this put out on a mines rescue site, which was on a mine site. Um, but the original one was that this is in a, a room uh, in the School of Mining, and we set up a, a proof of concept system. And the difference between that was that we, we tried uh, virtual reality headsets that have been tried and tested, data gloves, touch screens, and joysticks, the various interfaces to, to interact with the environment. It got pretty much the same structure as the uh, option one, but it, uh, apart from it, it got the large screen. So we were then looking for group interaction. So this person here would uh, do some action, and the group could learn from that action. So you could learn from people's, cons uh, you know, make, make mistakes and learn from those consequences, but the group could also learn from that. And then the third option was um, container-based simulators that are mobile around the, um, and can be moved around the mine sites. They, they've become quite popular around various mine sites around Australia and elsewhere. What we decided and recommended to the client was that we would go for option two because it was site-based and people would take ownership of that, that technology and start to use it, whereas this might go in a container go out on site, and unless it was into, there was an integration plan, it might not be fully utilized. So the, we were trying to get people to engage in that, uh, think about that issue. Also, we were looking at spatial awareness simulations within the mine. So we're looking at how the mine you interact with the mine environment, not just the trucks or shovels, etc. cetera. Um, so we presented option two to the client. There were some main, main concern, uh, major concerns uh, that the cost was just too high, even for all three of these, these options at that stage, because it was untested. So uh, what they wanted was this lower cost approach, and it was a bit of a, um, quite difficult to, to keep, keep them engaged. So they wanted to see that there was some sort of proof of concept. So what I did, I applied for a, an infrastructure grant through the university and uh, built that room. And it's fair to say that that was actually quite a turning point for projects. So they, they showed that there was commitment by the university. And once we got that concept together, industry started to, to give us a, extra funding to build on that. So that was quite a catalyst for the, the project. Just to talk about um, some of the logistics and actually what's required to build these, these VR systems. We used uh, 3D modeling packages like 3DS Max and Maya. They're just industrial off-the-shelf modeling software. And 
I don't know if, how much you know that, that but they, they're used in the film and industry and they're actually very powerful nowadays and you can do a, some really quite high resolution rendering. Uh, but the issue is that to build these models we need graphic artists and computer programmers and they're quite labour intensive to produce. So that was something that we had we flagged quite early on and I'll, I'll speak about that a bit more in a moment. So we built some proof of concept uh, coal mine simulations, so they're underground coal environments. Um, initially I had mining students just doing the programming and modelling. That wasn't sustainable, so I needed to, to review that. So I expanded the group to bring in different disciplines. Uh, and also by doing that, you had a richer environment because not everybody thinks the same. Engineers tend to look at engineering problems, but artists look at the, the whole problem. So some of the modelling was done differently. Um, we had good support from industry, we got access to mine plans, photos and mine access which was, was fine but um, the quality of the information uh, was, was not very good because, and it had, we needed a different method to that. But the, the mine that we produced, industry said it's great but our mine doesn't look like that. So this is one of the uh, issues that was starting to come up was acceptance of the technology. Um, even within New South Wales, if you move from Newcastle down to Wollongong, the, the underground mine environment in the coal industry is quite different from site to site and people pick on that detail and that's where the, the, you start to get resistance for the technology. So there's, there's some sort of change management that needs to be addressed there as well. Um, they also wanted more group-based training and to tie into, com into competency-based training too. So they didn't like the headset. We are headset because it removed the people from the group. They wanted them to stay in the group and act and behave like they would do if they were really working underground. Um, just from the point of view, I was saying there, uh, I, I've done this chart um, with a paper that I wrote with Andrew a long, quite a while ago now that was the issue of acquiring consistent data. Virtual reality is actually 100% computer generated, so everything's got to be um, generated by people. And the, the justification for doing that, uh, particularly in, coal in the coal industry, and it's quite different from the hard rock industry, is that the risks involved in taking electronic equipment underground just actually put up a barrier for you to actually go underground and physically get image, image and reference. So you have to build everything from a, an artistic representation. A much more rapid development method would probably be augmented reality. Uh, unless, of course, you can just use reality economically and safely. So that was quite a barrier. And that, that, that's probably held back the development of a VR simulation uh, as being the development of the virtual worlds that we show on these uh, great systems, it's just, it is quite an issue. Um, so that system went out into the um, into the industry. Uh, it was funded by a research project by Coal Services uh, and ACARP, where we continued to build uh, capability. We tried to um, improve the model development and implementation, make that more rapid. Graphic artists certainly increased and speeded up that process. Um, but we were trying to, as well, set up a system of protocols for miners and train workers and people out on mine sites to build their own simulations. That just wouldn't happen, I don't think, at, the, at that stage. The, what, it's not on their core business, and they really weren't interested in doing that. They just wanted a product they took and um, just used. Uh, we established templates, tried to establish a flow of information from trainers, but some were better at passing information over than others. Um, and we decided to, to develop some proof of concept simulations such as unaided self-escape, so if there's a fire underground, we need to uh, exit safely. Rib stability, which is a problem where the, root, the, the walls in the mine, uh, sometimes they can be loose and it can fall on people, um, and sprains and strains. So we did deployed a generic proof of concept uh, system at the mines rescue stations. So there's one of the first, that is the, the first system that we put out there, just with the touch screen. That's now been superseded by iPads, so that shows again the data, the, the technology. So we just have a touch screen to interact with the larger uh, screen there. And this is actually a representation of a person wearing their self-escape 
uh, mask, the breathing apparatus, and they've got to evacuate from the mine. As soon as that system, even though it looks very basic, as soon as that was put out on site, the trainers used it straight, straight away because it was a visualization tool that they could explain concepts to, to mine workers. So um, it was quite valuable, but it did tend to be used like a, uh, an enhanced video. Um, so that was pretty su a successful implementation. Um, but there, there was in, industry were happy with it, but it, they definitely wanted uh, to lift the, the, the quality of the simulations and see if we could um, improve the modules and to see if we could look at a fresh approach. So we took stock and did a second scoping study, reviewed all the um, different simulated technologies again, which it, you know you can imagine over five years in the computer graphics industry, things had changed quite significantly. We wanted to broaden the project, uh, and once we did that uh, and established collaborative links, the, the momentum in the project got going really, really quickly. We started to use um, advanced gaming software. We looked at Talk, but that, that fell away quite quickly. Unreal, that fell away quite quickly because of licensing issues. And then we used uh, Virtuals at, to develop the simulations because that had got a drag and drop interface that allowed artists to start building the modules as opposed to just pure programmers. Um, we started collaborating with iCinema because they, they were using this software and we we're going to use some of these large environments as well. So it just made um, access to uh, large screen technologies a, a bit simpler. There's just an example of the drag and drop software that we were using. So the idea is we've got the 3D world that's been built and to put any all the interaction onto it, we just drag various parameters on and, and wire it up a bit like a, a wiring diagram rather than having to compile code and that. And that, that's quite a quick way for rapid prototyping, but the issue is that these, as you can see, those diagrams can get very complex and very messy if they're not disciplined in uh, managing those processes. Um, we started to look at interfacing real-time laser scans. That was one of the objectives to start producing 3D models very um, quickly. But again, there's, there's processing, and it ended up that the intervention of people to do the processing of laser scans was the same as building a model like that. So uh, we hadn't quite got that worked out. We recommended to the mines rescue stations that they ut utilize large screens to get that one-to-one -one scale. So we started putting images like, like that onto the screen, on those large screens, brought industry in, and um, that's what was a turning point. It's fair to say uh, there that they, that's, they actually said, that's what we want, a one-to-one -one scale, show people the, the real environment, they feel like they're in the, the environment, and we can show that the, the scale of things, the problems that they would bring, and away, uh, really away, away the project went. So we installed that first 160 screen by, uh, provided by VR Solutions at the Old Mines Rescue Station. Again, these guys, as soon as that was switched on, they were away. They, um, I think what it was, they, they had that technology and then it went down for, for a week whilst we were upgrading it and they realized how valuable it was in their training. So it, it became quite a part of the training process very quickly. Uh, so then, once we'd got to that stage, that it, the coal services jumped into it in a, in a um, really engaged with the technology, and they decided that they were going to have all these systems at their mines rescue stations. So they've got four mines rescue stations uh, in New South Wales, and there's also some other ones up around Queensland, and that were deployed at Newcastle, Singleton, Lithgow, and Wollongong. And they put four visualization systems in at each one. The first one was in the original format. The second one is, was an eye dome, like the dome behind you there. Uh, each one had an interface and joystick controls with high-end graphics cards, and people could actually interact with the mining environment with there. The idea was that it, those would be one to three people for looking at specific tasks. And then we went up to the um, large-scale 10-meter cylinder where we can get groups of people in, and they can do their training. 
I'll stop talking for a minute now and I'll actually show you some of the modules that we can, can see on, on there and then I'll explain to you some of the other issues that came up after we'd, do, we'd done the, mod, the modules. So it's, um, can you just help me drive these? So I'll show you uh, cut down versions. There's, there's probably 16 modules that would have built for this project. Um, but I'll show you a couple of them, and they've got cut down versions just to, so they'll run on my laptop. But they are they're fully interactive when they're deployed on those those systems. Uh, so let's go out of there. So the first one is um, do this one here. So deputies. Now, I'm always afraid of real-time demos because you never, <laughs> you never know. There we go. <laughs> so, So this, this, gives, this is the underground virtual environment. Um, when it's deployed on site, this can actually be in stereo, but we only, um, only really use stereo when we need to show a, a 3D problem. Uh, otherwise, we just, just use, it, use it in mono. So if, if you just let it uh, start up. So this'll, um, this is deputy's inspection. Within the last two hours, the power to the machines is off and the fan is running. So just space balance You have arrived in the panel with a team comprising two minor operators, two shuttle car drivers, two bumper operators, two support crew. Okay. How do you proceed after disembarking the transport? So we've gone for, jump forward a bit here, but we're actually still at the Crib, crib room. So, in this this module and the various other modules, um, this panel would be off to the side. It wouldn't exclude the, the view like that. But there's every all the people in the audience would have a click pad, and to answer that that question, there'd be a discussion, and you'd get consistent uh, consensus. So those uh, grey boxes would either go green or or red, and we'd the trainer or instructor can see whether there's somebody's getting the message or not, and then if they they're getting it wrong, they can focus on that, that task and, and develop it. So there's various options there, and if the, uh, the trainees have done the preparation, they should be able to answer those, those questions. What inspections are required before work can commence in the panel? So that before you can actually do anything underground in a mine, there are some quite strict rules that you have to stick, stick to, as you saw from those rules and regulations, and you've got to be able to work through those systematically. So let's. So, uh, so this is for a deputy. Before we ever start work, the deputy's got to move from this crib room here, where his team's uh, come to start work, and he's got to navigate from here to the face and just do some basic inspections. So I might just. Like that. So that actually A is the correct answer. That is correct. So now I've actually got to physically navigate. Can you do that? So, so just you need to head towards where that guy is. Just slow, and then turn right. So the idea of this is that there's only one efficient way of inspecting that panel. And if we go the wrong way, so if you just steadily go up towards the face, it'll it'll catch us and just let it catch up. That's it. This is not the preferred route. So it tells us, so we've actually got to go back. And eventually people, the idea was that people will know the most efficient route to go and uh, inspect that, um, that coal face. So let's, if we do that, turn around and then turn left down there. So the, within this environment, you can see the, it's a coal mine, but it's quite light. So then if you need to go that way, but you've got to go around the feeder breaker. This is not the preferred route. It's okay, so if you go down there. And then that way. So, 
the deputy will do his inspection. The cam when there's something that's important, the camera g grabs them, and we've got to look in there. Are there any materials in there? And th that should be full of roof bolts, but it's not. Okay, just click it. And then we'll just turn around and walk up to the continuous miner and then we'll go to one of the others. So the a point I'd like to get from here, this interaction at the moment, this is an early module and the, the pe industry people that are helping us develop it, as the resolution of these images are, is increased, the industry input increases as well. When it's an early lower resolution cartoon VR model, we couldn't get engagement, but as we've got more and more resolution, even though it's not maybe not necessary, necessary educationally, but for engagement it was, and for credibility. Um, so as, as the modules progressed and they got more and more experienced, um, this, this text drops off and it becomes a more um, find out and explore and learn type of training so you just need to is the support adequate? so it's asking is the support in the roof adequate but we shouldn't go down there because uh, it's dangerous so just come back so that's a basic sort of training for deputies uh, we've got the ventilation tubes in there um, so I'll just start show you another one that shows a bit more severe consequence so excuse me So this next one is, as the trainers started to get used to the technology, they thought, oh, we can start to look at more risk management approach. And the idea is that we want to get people's attention first so that um, they know the consequences before they even start doing any training. And that really focuses on them. And one of the serious issues uh, in underground coal mining in some areas is gas outburst. So we'll just let this run. So this is actually, the good thing about VR as well is you can get impossible angles. So these people in mining, this is a, the shuttle cart moves the coal. There's a bump, that's a seismic event. There's a, lights are flashing. And that's actually a, a gas outburst. That's when people are mining towards a fault without putting in correct ground conditions doing their monitoring, looking at geological indicators, water indicators, that event is, is something that can actually happen if, if the ground control and support is not um, done correctly. And with virtual reality, something that we can do that we can't do in real life, or well, we can't do that as a training exercise, is we can come into the rock. Sorry, just let me look at the screen. We can actually show how severe the consequences of that, that would be. And then we can come back in and explain to them why that situation's happened. And the reason is, if we look there in the, Im in the image, <coughs> this is a, an igneous rock, so there's been a fracture in the rock, and it's been uh, in the sedimentary rock of the coal. It's been filled with igneous rock at, uh, through some uh, volcanic activity. And when you're mining towards that sort of feature, that's the stress regime changes quite significantly. And unless it's controlled, uh, you'll get these, these coal outbursts and they can be quite severe consequences. So, but there are uh, controls that you can put in place and make sure you monitor them and you can prevent that. So you can actually mine through there uh, quite safely without having that event, but it, uh, it's the way that the mining is approached. So you can see that through VR, you can actually show people severe consequences. And we could, the power of this system is that we could have, like there are 10 indicators, and we could have a team of six or eight people working in there. Um, and the impact of our actions by missing one of these pointers, we could be 1% from a disaster like that. And you, you could be working down there for week after week and not realize that you're only that close to having a disaster. And it's only luck that's kept, kept you away from that. Okay, so I'll move from that one. 
So they're underground coal simulations. So then we were looking at moving into hard rock and mining construction. So we've got a, a surface mine simulation that's actually being constructed and it was Olympic Dam expansion was the site. Um, unfortunately, this project got caught in the global financial crisis in 2008, so it, uh, it was completed, but it wasn't um, taken all the way into to the industry, but it's, it's still good from a proof of concept. So this is um, working at heights, and the idea is that the people that have not worked in the industry, don't understand how complex the rules and regulations are for doing operations on site. So this, this technology we thought would be useful to show them how difficult it is to actually do an operation out on site and the amount of time and preparation that must be done before you actually go out on site and do any, any actions. So I might drive, drive this because it's... Uh, the keys are a bit... So we give the, um, the trainees an option to have a look at the site first. So I'll say yes, just so you can see what the 3D models that are in here. So this is a surface, surface mine. So within it, for working on uh, working at heights, we've got scaffolding. I've got a, a correctly erected scaffolding, a poorly erected scaffolding. Uh, and the idea is that they have to go along and identify what the problems are and, and remedy those. An excavation, so you wouldn't normally think of an excavation when you're working down, but that's actually a working at heights problem as well. So we were looking at uh, demonstrating that there, there's risk associated with that environment as well. And then um, this one was actually ladders, and I won't go all the way through because it, it takes a, a long time, but the idea with this was that the that lamp, the globe has gone in that lamp, and the, these two guys need to change it. Um, we let them go all the way through the process, look at all the intricacies of the rules and regulations that they've got to apply to that, but the real outcome is that, that they should get is that that lamp shouldn't be there so that they've got to use ladders or an elevated work platform. It should be up on the framework where, and re-engineered. So it makes people look at re-engineering the facilities so that they're actually safe and you cut down risk from that point of view. Because the tendency is if you you know, worked on building sites from years ago, you just put a ladder up there and run up and change the light globe. But on a mine site, um, it's just not acceptable to do that because of the risk. So I'll just run one of these uh, modules. And there's an ele elevated work platform, and I'll start that up afterwards. So what this simulation does. Can we raise that volume a little bit? So the machine talks to us, and um, what we were aiming towards with this was not instructor-led training, but we were trying to automate this system. Um, and that's where we were, were looking at the, um, reducing the amount of text on the screen. With the, uh, the simulation in particular, I started to get occupational psychologists to look at people's cognitive processes and how we introduce information in the, in the right manner so that they can build up schemas in their head and take those out on site and reproduce them. So he's got his helmet on. Safety glasses. You are now properly outfitted to explore the site. So he's, he's ready to go just from the point of view of going out on site and to have a look. And down here, there's all information within the uh, filing cabinet there that they need to work with as well. But let's just head home. So, uh, try to think of the best one. I'll, we'll look at the excavation. So before we start this simulation, the trainees, they get 100 points, and the idea is that they need to maintain those 100 points, and each time they make a mistake, they lose five, or if it's a real consequence, they'll, uh, bad consequence, they'll lose them all. So we need to run through a few things to get going. The ground near an old wash bay has been contaminated by a buildup of residue from ground vehicles. 
It is being cleaned up as part of our environmental policy using a front-end loader or backhoe, and will be backfilled with uncontaminated soil. The work was anticipated to take one day and dig no deeper than one meter. Are you a visitor or a member of the crew? So we say we're a crew member. Inside the restricted area tape is a no-go area unless you are a member of the work crew. Please keep clear and follow the instruction with any crew member. Are you familiar with excavation procedures? So we say no. Please pay particular attention to the steps indicated on the THA. Are you familiar with excavation procedures? So we need to look at the task hazard analysis and what we're showing in here, I've clicked the button too soon, sorry, that, so that dialogue's come up. But the, we, this is the sort of form and paperwork that they would have to fill in on site to do their risk job hazard analysis and risk assessment. And you can see it's quite a complex um, form, but they need to report that back. So let's just have a look. So I'll say yes now. Have you signed onto the THA? I think it'll tell me that I haven't if I say that. Incorrect. Because I, I just looked at... Have you signed onto the THA? I want the revised one. There we go. I didn't pass this Incorrect. training myself. <laughs> Have you signed onto the THA? Let me get the right one. There we go. Please select the original THA from the filing cabinet. Yeah, that's it. So I've gone through the wrong procedure. You see. Okay. So that, I've got to click on that one. Come back. No additional key to me is required beyond the site standard. So that's the outcome that the system wants me to know is that I don't need to put more safety equipment on and uh, I just got a bit out of sync there because I've, I've forgotten Please about the train. Please select the revised THA from the filing cabinet. Please select the revised THA from the filing cabinet. Okay. So that's got a lot more information on that one there. So. Is modified soil disturbance permit required for this job? <clears throat> the soil disturbance permit is now updated and a work at height permit issued. All pre-work issues have been addressed. Work can now commence. Some aspects of this task are not being performed according to the correct procedures. How many can you identify? So this is in training mode now. So to give people an idea, they've actually put question marks to give a, a hint of where these, uh, these problems might be. So then, If you say no, and if you, each time I'd made a mistake on that task hazard analysis, I've lost five points, so I'm probably not going to be here on Monday. Okay. But I'll stop there because this will go on for a long time. Okay. Um, so that, that was working at heights. Thanks, and um, I'll just finish up, uh, we've got a couple of, there's a, there's a slightly different one, I realise it's 12 o'clock now, um, there's one more that's, that's done on a uranium mine in Northern Territory that's take a completely different method of producing those, I can show that very quickly, so maybe one well, minute. What we might do is, given it is 12 o'clock and people might have yeah. some appointments, we'll, we'll stop it here, we'll um, perhaps um, have a few questions and then um, there are some demonstrations that if people are able to stay behind, uh, can uh, look at those afterwards. Yeah. So, is there any questions from the audience? Yeah, they take the questions. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Just start with one. <laughs> uh, I had a wacky idea earlier. Wouldn't this be an awesome thing to stick inside you? <laughs> a little module inside you, because you're always looking for new things to do. Um, I, I've got a bit of background in mines house missing in underground metal mines. Worked with ACG and, and wasn't. And um, I can see some applications for training um, to do with managing risk around the seismic mines. 
it is, so it's really wonderful. I, I really like what you're doing. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, well, let's uh, thank Philip for his presentation. Okay, thanks a lot.